Desert Island Discs. Welcome to the program. Yeah. Good evening and welcome to yet another edition of Desert Island Discs, your number one personality profile program. On the show this evening, a distinguished gentleman by all accounts, but a guy that has revolutionized the way we have always known the healthcare system in our country. And it looks like he's breaking barriers and looking at Africa and perhaps the whole world. Now, you may be asking yourself, how old could this guy be? Well, he'll be telling us on the program, but I'll tell you what. He comes in the most minute packages, literally in every sense of the word. But the greatness in there, you and I will agree, especially by the end of this conversation, that we are speaking with greatness in our midst. Welcome to the program, Dr. Musinguzi. Yeah, very, very, very nice to be here, uh, Simon. It's a real pleasure. I thought you were going uh, to blame me for the flower introductions, <laughs> but I'm, I'm glad that... <laughs> well, uh, in the public speaking class, they said the introduction always has to be flower. That's how, <laughs> that's how people follow through on the conversation. Exactly. But so uh, yeah, glad to be here. This is Dr. Davis Musinguzi, who is the CEO of Rocket Health. Now, if you haven't partaken of their services, I'll just say, without sounding like I'm making an advert, but if previously you had to go queue up at the health facility, get seen by a doctor if you are lucky, then uh, tests are made on you, mm -hmm. they call it the triage, and then mm -hmm. after that they do the proper tests, and then before you know it, the prescription is made, and then the mm -hmm. meds are given to you, or you're mm -hmm. given a cheat to go to a pharmacy. Mm -hmm. All this could consume no less than four hours and take you to about four geographical locations. Sure. With their health services, they'll, they'll tell you, phone call away or an email, and everything is sorted. Before you know it, someone is at your doorstep to pick your samples, and the next thing, Dr. Mm -hmm. Davis Musing is on the call yeah. to explain to you what is afflicting you and what next steps. Yeah. But maybe you could describe Rocket yeah. Health better for us. Yeah, sure. So um, we've been trying to figure out how we can make healthcare better for a long time. Mm -hmm. uh, going through medical school, I realized that the healthcare system is broken. And it's not enough to become the best possible doctor if in you're going broken. to be in, be in a broken <laughs> system. So uh, I think I got very passionate about figuring out how to do the system differently. Mm -hmm. uh, healthcare hasn't changed much almost for the last 100 years. It's been hospitals, clinics, go see the doctor, go queue up here, wait for your results here, go back here. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a whole <laughs> maze. Get up, here. Uh, exactly, that here. not many people are familiar with. So we thought, you know, at the time in 2011, 2012, that there must be a way that technology can make this better. Technology was already transforming so many other different systems, the financial um, systems and, you know, everywhere else, how we interacted with people through mm -hmm. social media. People were starting to adopt mobile phones, smartphones, internet connectivity. And we thought, surely this must be our opportunity to figure out how technology can make healthcare easier. Mm -hmm. Now, what is interesting is that people had already historically been taking phone calls, doctors, this is, mm -hmm. from patients. After you've seen a patient, they go back home. Guess what? You're the one they're calling next. If you're the only doctor amongst your friends and in your family, uh, be sure you'll be the one who's yeah. taking these phone calls, <laughs> exactly. right? But uh, that information would never get documented anywhere. Uh, that interaction is, you know, never made official or recorded anywhere. So we thought, you know, maybe we can just take this existing behavior and transform it into a call center uh, that we can staff with doctors 24 hours, seven days a week, and, uh, m you know, see who can be able to uh, call in and uh, get a consultation from the doctor, have your history taken. And if we think you need any lab tests, we could recommend some labs where you could go. If you needed any medicines, we could write your prescription and you can go get it at your nearby pharmacy. And that's pretty much how it started uh, in 2012 and officially launched in 2013. And within the first six months, we had 7,000 people using the service. Mm -hmm. And it really showed us that there's definitely something here for us to look into. And, you know, first it was just consultation only. People knew us by many names, WhatsApp doctor, doctors on call, <laughs> ETC. But really, we were registered as the medical concierge group at the time. You're speaking in plural. We. We. Yes. We realize. <laughs> we did well. Who is we? Yeah, so we is a group of friends uh, and colleagues that I went to school with. Uh, some I went to school with them at St. Mary's College, Kisubi. Some I found at King's College, Budo. Some I found in medical school and some others I found in my work. So we are four people when we got started, that four co-founders. Mm -hmm. And uh, what we did at the time was to just set up this medical call center uh, that people now refer to as uh, Rocket Health after we added the pharmacy delivery, the lab sample pickup, the clinic, the e-shop, and you know, all these other components. So right now you can be able to you know, call or chat with the doctor. You can use USSD uh, to be able to reach us and the doctor will call you back. They'll ask you about your symptoms, 
I will record all your symptoms in our electronic medical record system. Uh, if you need a prescription or a lab test, we'll notify the lab team. The lab team uh, will come to your location, home, office, school, pick your sample, bring that into the lab, we run the test. Um, the doctor gets notified your results are ready. We call you back, we explain your results to you, we have them delivered to your email. And if you need a prescription thereafter, the pharmacy will pack that and have that delivered to you by a pharmacy technician. Wow. And if we cannot handle your case remotely, we'll ask you to physically come into our clinic. Mm -hmm. uh, and you know, it's appointments fast, so there's zero waiting time. If we're seeing Simon at 3 p.m., we already have his history in the system. We know who is coming. We know what he's coming in to do. If you he know, shows up at the uh, uh, throw up Exactly, <laughs> right? <laughs> and, uh, uh, and within you know, 30 minutes, you know, you're pretty much out and uh, hopefully feeling better. Well, a few things come to mind as you explain this otherwise revolutionary, yeah. uh, you know, system yeah. of you know working on healthcare system. Yeah. Two things come to mind. One, mm. do you entertain calls coming in in the local dialect? Yes. For better explanation, or but also these people who cannot Definitely. explain how they are feeling. Someone says, <laughs> "I feel spears in my chest." I mean, so how do you write that? Yeah, yeah. So, so, so one of the interesting things that we did in the early days was we got involved with a lot of development programs mm -hmm. that had a presence across the country. So, our UN programs, our USAID programs, mm -hmm. where we were kind of uh, making doctors close, move, come, get closer to people that would ordinarily never have a doctor attending to them and their health wow. symptoms. So a lot of people in the rural parts of the country have actually used Rocket Health uh, quite frequently. And because of that, we had to diversify the languages that we can speak within our, our medical call center. Mm -hmm. So we can pretty much speak uh, any language from any major corner of the country right now. Wow, so it doesn't matter if it's your grandmother that's calling us, mm -hmm. we'll be able to attend to her in the local language that she knows and understands. And also and to understand what she means when she says, I have spears in my chest. Exactly. <laughs> and also a very good thing that the medical education system did was to really distribute people across different parts of the country as mm -hmm. part of their medical training. So many people have picked up on the local language and the terms that are used within the healthcare setting. So even when they come back into the city to serve people from those areas, they're very familiar with how to take wow. uh, their history. What yeah. about the whole feel by we patients that, mm -hmm. you know, I, w much many years before you, your revolution mm -hmm. idea came mm -hmm. to mind, I would go to some health facilities and you're speaking to a doctor, the doctor hasn't touched you at all, but he's just on his computer <laughs> putting in whatever yeah. it is you're telling him yeah. or maybe Googling the, the symptoms you have <laughs> so I thought. Previously, when you, you, know, when you arrive, yeah. the doctor, you know, open your mouth, your yeah. flashes, uh, you know, torch in, the, torch in the mouth, then of course yeah. the ears, yeah. then gets out the stethoscope, yeah. you puts it on the you know, back of yeah. your chest and say, mm, take mm. a deep breath, breath. Uh, you know, exactly. look at you, touch you, yeah. and for the older men, you know, yeah. press your prostate. <laughs> that doesn't seem to happen yeah. with you. I yeah. just have to speak to you on the phone. I don't even yeah. get to know you, to yeah. feel your facial expression and all that. Yeah. Don't you get some feedback to the extent yeah. that baby people think they are speaking to robots? Yeah. I, that, was, that has always been the concern with telemedicine, that uh, how can you deliver an accurate diagnosis or a treatment plan without a physical examination? Mm -hmm. And what we have learned over time, and even they'll tell you this in your medical training, one of the best skill sets you can ever have is in taking history. Taking proper history can lead you to an accurate diagnosis much better than anything else. Normally, when you get to the point of physical examination, you're either confirming or ruling out what you have already suspected in the history you have taken. Wow. And what we have also seen is that 70% of the conditions that take people to an outpatient clinic uh, can, best be can easily be diagnosed uh, by just taking enough history. And what we have also had to do internally is to also really facilitate the training of a lot of our doctors to move them from a, a bedside care mentality to a website care mentality wow, like so they're, they're they're way Bedside more thorough website. exactly right <laughs> so they're now way more thorough they are way more discerning around your system symptoms they are very keen on figuring out whether this is something we can resolve remotely or this is something that needs to be seen physically and they'll always make that call to say you know what it's not enough for us to have this remote consultation we should see you physically and, and we're always very quick to make that recommendation so i think you know it, there are very many things that we can do remotely uh, but then there are also some things that must be done uh, physically, and we have a, a physical clinic where we're able to do that, and we have specialists on hand for that. Yeah. Tremendous, Dr. Msingwizi. Yeah. Thank you very much. Now, on the program here, of course, it's personality <laughs> profiling. Yes, yes. You have told us everything about Rocket Health <laughs> and the medical concierge yeah. group. You've told us nothing about yourself except dropping a few things. I was in school here and there, yeah, yeah. and that's what we actually are coming down to. Okay. But before we do that, we play our music on the program. Yes. What would be your first song? Well, my first song. Um, 
Yeah, when I was going through medical school and uh, I, you know, music has always been a passion. Oh, tremendous. And one thing that's interesting about me is that I've always been a very ambitious person and I think many people may, may, Nothing has changed. <laughs> may hold testimony <laughs> to that. And this one particular song by Drake, mm -hmm. uh, Successful, wow. was really, you know, motivation music. And, you know, I've seen him go throughout his career as, a, as an artist and uh, as I've also hustled along, <laughs> I feel like a lot of that trajectory and his music kind of resonated. So I'll start with uh, Successful Success. by Drake. Tremendous, what a beautiful song, the way to start a Saturday evening with motivation and vigor that comes from listening to such incredible lyrics. We'll be right back in Desert Island. Desert Island Discs. Welcome back to the program. It's Dr. Davis Musingu, the guy of Rocket Health. We'll keep it as simple as that. But now we're diving into who exactly is. So who are you? Where were you born? To whom were you born? <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I was born in Kampala. Uh, I was born to uh, two wonderful parents, uh, Polycarp and Lydia Musinguzi. Uh, my dad, uh, he's an academic. Mm -hmm. He's a book smart guy. And my mom, on the other hand, Street, street smart, smart. So <laughs> maybe, maybe that, that combo <laughs> led to me and uh, yeah so I, I pretty much uh, grew up in uh, Kampala my very early years my my dad in 88 I was born in 86 Wow. Uh, my dad in 88 uh, went for a PhD program uh, in the UK at the University of Southampton and he had three boys by then wow. uh, by the time he, he left so we all went to the UK for a while. Okay. Uh, oh, you went with the family? You went with the entire family. Were you the first of the three boys? Or I you was the second. Uh -huh. I was the second of the three mm -hmm. uh, at the time, yes. Uh, and then we later on expanded to five. Uh, <laughs> five with the last one being a girl. Uh -huh. Yes. Uh, and the, the only rest, girl. The only fact. girl and the last. Yes. Wow. Um, heavily so protected. <laughs> heavily <an> protected. <laughs> four gladiators. <laughs> yeah, so, uh, so, yeah, so the early years were, were in the UK up to when I was uh, maybe five or six years old. Ah, true. And uh, when he got done with his PhD, we had to come back to Uganda. What was he studying exactly? Uh, economics. He's ah. an economist. So he's a banker. His entire career has been with the Central Bank of Uganda, and then later on with the IMF. Is he yeah. still at the IMF now? He retired. He retired. He didn't like the U.S. very much. <laughs> 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 and he decided to uh, come back here and uh, retired at the Bank of Uganda, yes. Oh, so he's yes. retired at the Bank of Uganda. So he's retired at the Bank of Uganda, yes. Oh, Dr. Polycarp Musumuzi, yes. And you, formative years in the U.K., of course, just mm. as you're getting into kindergarten, mm. back to Kampala, our city mm. as we know it. Yeah. What was it like for you? Oh, my, earliest, my earliest memories are, are still UK memories. Mm -hmm. I remember uh, collecting caterpillars and butterflies in glass jars and, you know, my dad <laughs> carrying me to kindergarten. And what was interesting in kindergarten is all we did was play. So we colored, we played with what do you call them, hula hoops, yeah, exactly. and had all these fun things. And then uh, the cultural shock for me when I came back was being put up in Buganda Road Primary School. <laughs> and now we're studying ba be bi bo bu, cha che chi cho chu. <laughs> Like, uh, where, where's, where's the fun and games, right? <laughs> and uh, it didn't help that I also didn't speak any of the local languages and I kind of came off as having an accent. Exactly. And, and strange. Uh, <laughs> exactly. And I had to kind of hang on to one or two people that uh, I could make uh, good friends and, you know, kind of just hold who my Who spoke like you or who didn't mind how you spoke? Uh, maybe they didn't <laughs> mind or maybe they, they were curious, I suppose, uh -huh. but we made, we made good friends. So you yes. remember their yeah. names? Yes, Matovo Nicholas. Uh, mm -hmm. Unfortunately, he passed away last yeah. year due to COVID-19. Oh. Uh, but he was one of the very first friends that uh, I made. Yeah. Well, I sound like the guy on the left side of the Messiah on that hill where they were being crucified. Uh, yeah. So you save everyone else and you couldn't save your best friend. Well, it, uh, it's shocking how it even happened. It uh, one happened very quickly. I was also out of the country at the time. Oh, yeah. And it was, you know, at that time, you just didn't think that young people could get that sick and that ill and progress and that quickly and yeah it just so happened that uh, he was one of those victims oh, yeah sad so story. yeah sad story there but uh, i think also as a doctor you have to learn how to deal with grief uh one way or the other otherwise it just you know takes over i would yeah. ask you the statistics of those you handle <laughs> who end up this way the other way yeah. let's just keep it see yeah. talk about your life <laughs> so Buganda yeah, primary sure. school so Buganda hundreds of you in a stream oh wow <laughs> that was another <laughs> culture shock right a hundred kids in a stream mm -hmm. Uh, you know, just trying to navigate uh, an entire school of possibly, uh, well, I think, over a thousand kids at the time. 
um, you know, large, dusty. Everybody liked to play football in the back. Exactly. Uh, I started wearing glasses very early. Mm -hmm. I started wearing glasses when I was five. So I didn't have the luxury of uh, being as playful as I'd have wanted to. I tried, but you know, after I broke because my specs one, two, three times, <laughs> <depends> <laughs> my parents were not having it. So yeah, that you know, the very early years, I kind of kept very reserved and you know, just focused on you know, kind of more, you know, Do you use games. better your specs, really? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, I always tried to sit at the front of the class because of you know the eyesight situation. Mm -hmm. And, you know, maybe that helped one or the other. Yeah, exactly. You can see that. <laughs> they paid off that very well. Yes. And then home, uh, what kind of parents did you have in the sense of, you know, helping you transition from a very liberal and maybe mm. colorful childhood to mm. a structured and one where you were raised by a village, but also most mm. importantly where spanking you once in a while yeah. is not a case for you to call the police. Spanking was never missing from our family. Oh, really? Even in the UK? I'm sure it did miss. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure it did. Maybe they're a bit more careful or hush hush about it. Okay. But uh, I think. Uh, when they came here, it now became. Uh, <laughs> most certainly. Especially and uh, it wasn't just one of you, it was all of you. Why didn't you tell us that this one was behaving like this? So all of you are. You know, culpable. <laughs> wow, that's interesting. Yeah, just yeah, to but say. I think the tough part was kind of just uh, relearning the local languages again. That's why my Luganda has never really been on point. My Ruchiga is, uh, I can speak it, hear it, but I won't give a speech. Ah, okay. <laughs> no idioms, no, no idioms. It saves no. you a lot. Eh? You I, don't know what I, I, Chiga, um, idioms and sayings and proverbs. Sound exactly. Like. <laughs> but well, we've we'll learned over time, uh, both my parents are Bachiga, so uh, it got spoken a lot in the home. We had uh, extended family living with us. We learned a lot from them. Why so that really did help. So we were living in Intinda. Mm -hmm. So I grew up in Intinda when Intinda was the last stage. Ah, uh, of the taxis direction. in that direction and you'd have to walk a little bit to get home on uh, Mata's way um, we we're very fortunate that uh, my parents I think bought a house when they came back and you know we pretty much grew up in that house and have very many memories in that house of all the kids that grew up in Intinda mm -hmm. and over time when we eventually moved out of that house uh, we moved to Kalinavi uh, where my parents also built uh, their first house. Mm -hmm. uh, it took them seven years to build their own home. Wow. And I, you know, it's, uh, it's unlikely that you hear of those kind of stories these days. These days, yes, months, three, eh? six months, people <laughs> have a structure up, people are moving in. I, I, but, you know, if you have five kids and you're on uh, a single salary and um, my mom is, you know, a, a businesswoman and a trader, uh, I think, and you're, you're building from your savings. It takes a whole, a whole lot more time and a whole lot more patience, and mm -hmm. I think that for me was, you know, quite the lesson that they could build uh, a dream home and move all of us into that. Uh, so yeah, I pretty much spent my time there until I went to university, and after university, I never looked you back. You didn't go back. Uh, there, there was <laughs> no going back <laughs> after that. <laughs> well, from Buganda yeah. Road, where did life take you? Because now we. Yeah. So uh, anybody that went to Buganda Road probably knew Mr. Almeida. Of course, and even those <laughs> of us who did had the hollowing stories of, <laughs> of Mr. Almeida. So Mr. Almeida eventually moves to Lohana Academy, mm -hmm. brand new school. Uh, takes a lot of other teachers with him. Uh, I was in my primary six at the time. And that's closer uh, to Tinder, so you say, okay. Right, and uh, I, I'd done pretty well in my, in, in my primary school. And the par my parents thought, you know what, maybe it will make a difference if you actually move to Lohana so that you can maintain the same kind of quality of education mm -hmm. that can, you know, get you over to the next stage. So uh, I eventually, m you know, made the shift to Lohana Academy, and that's where I finished my primary living exams. <coughs> and uh, I was fortunate to pass highly enough to go to St. Mary's College, Kisubi. The choice for St. Mary's College, Kisubi. Ah, yeah, that was another interesting <laughs> one. So, uh, so my brother was in King's College, Buddha at the time. Uh, he was uh, he's three years older than me. And I thought, you know, I could probably make that choice. I'd visited him, I'd visited the school, quite an old school mm -hmm. at that. And uh, the, boys, in every sense of the, uh, the boys wore shorts, and I had that the boys and St. Mary's wore trousers. Uh -huh, uh, uh, okay. <laughs> And then I think deep down, really what I wanted was to become my own man. And I thought that me finding myself and putting myself in an environment where uh, I wouldn't have any decisions influenced by a sibling or by anybody else, I could really kind of grow into my own self. And you know, I had a friend who had a brother at St. Mary's uh, who kind of kept on telling me stories. And you kind of want to go along with some of your friends, your friends. when you move into these schools, right? <laughs> exactly. So yeah, that's how we made the choice for Smack, and uh, off, off I went, right, <laughs> unregrettably. And went and had four 
the last four years. wonderful years four wonderful years i have made lifelong friends mm -hmm. from that experience I, I think you know even just the value system that i think for me was very fundamental um, being Praying every morning on a uh, exactly we're very disciplined very focused um the whole idea of you know manicured loans uh you know Come attending up. service <laughs> twice a week uh, i liked the camaraderie the solida as we called it <laughs> exactly uh, and and it's interesting yeah, how yeah. that worked very well for you yeah. <laughs> and <that's> devastating <laughs> for some of us. <laughs> I think I think I think SMAC makes does well for an O level school. Mm -hmm. It does very well for an O level school because you're all coming from different backgrounds, rich, poor, mm -hmm. smart. Others maybe not as smart but mm -hmm. well Let connected. Maybe, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> maybe well connected. Uh, but then you know, but smart not necessarily book smart, but people are smart in all kinds of ways. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that variation was really important. I got involved in rugby. It was the first sport I ever tried. Even uh, with your sweats? <laughs> I thought when the crash comes, the <laughs> rugby is much more devastating right. than the ball hitting you right. at 120 kilometers an hour on the face. Maybe it helps that I was short-sighted, so uh -huh. I'd only see you when you're really here. <laughs> <laughs> and there's so no chance of an escape. <laughs> <laughs> there's no chance of an escape, so we're definitely going to have our collision. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, a lot of the kids who are getting recruited into rugby, I think, was the most popular sport at the time. Mm -hmm. And, you know, like I said, I was trying to grow into my own self. So I was moving away from board games. I was very good at chess. I loved to play chess. Mm -hmm. And now I think I needed something more physical. I think as an adolescent, you have to find somewhere to put the energy. Exactly. And the also, pitch is a good way to put it. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Or oh, the one where you tell glorious stories to the babes and say, you know, <laughs> I <tackled laughs> this guy as yeah, opposed yeah. to I outsmarted him. <laughs> I, I was definitely not one of the biggest or one of the fastest, but uh, I think I was quite sneaky on the field yeah. uh, and <laughs> the breakdown. But yeah. I'm told guys of your body build, you know, the small guys are the most lethal on the yeah, rugby they can, they can. You don't know where they pass. They <laughs> <laughs> around the size of the ball. That's but true. Yeah. That's true. But I also learned a lot about things like teamwork, mm -hmm. right? practice, uh, training, uh, camaraderie, uh, planning, strategy, uh, facing adversaries. Every time you would go to these schools. And and exactly, mind. right? And, and, and I think, you know, just having something that brings the whole school together on a weekend, you know, for a game. You know, things like that were really interesting. Wow. And yeah, uh, yeah when I was informed too, I think uh, probably one of my best memories was uh, my dad had visited France. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> I think he had asked us for what we wanted to get. And I asked him to bring me a rugby ball and rugby boots. Wow. And he brought me this fantastic pair of uh, Adidas boots and a, a Gilbert rugby ball. Wow. And <clears throat> it, w it, was, uh, it, was, it, was, it was pretty interesting. And my dad would take you know, such an interest in, in, in a personal <laughs> hobby and finding these things and actually, you know, spending the money that he did on them. And interestingly, that ball is what the school used to play for their <laughs> inter-school games. And you had uh, the school captain, I don't know if you remember him, Cosmos, yes. uh, would come and borrow my boots uh, for the school <laughs> game. So I think there was some, you know, pride in, you know, being able to contribute in, in some of those ways. In that space of time, you're all level, where your eyes focused on saving lives as it is today, or you were just going through with mm. the meal, like the rest of us. Yeah, very interesting um, that you ask. Uh, when I was 12 years old, I, I think I'd always had an interest in science, mm -hmm. uh, biology, science. Um, my dad, from his work, used to get a magazine called The Economist, which many mm -hmm. people know. In The Economist, used to have a health section. In that health section, they would always talk about all these new advances the in breakthroughs. Uh, breakthroughs in, at that time, it was really genetics. Uh, so genetic engineering. Actually, a lot of that research and you know, kind of new ways of doing things uh, is kind of playing out today, interestingly, uh, even with vaccines and so on. But you know, so I got very interested in so from the latest from a tender age, you could pronounce deoxyacid. <laughs> <laughs> Right. So Many people would know that's just the why we call it DNA. Yeah, yeah. I was <laughs> very interested in science. Six months of practice. Yes. To pronounce that. Deoxyribonucleic acid. Exactly. There you are. Uh, so, so yeah, I was very interested in science. Um, my mom, when I was in P7S1, gave me a book, um, Think Big by Ben Carson. All right. Oh, mom. <laughs> and I think any kid that reads Ben Carson wants to become a neurosurgeon. Absolutely. And. Uh, I don't know how it has that effect, but it did have that effect on me. And so from a very early age, I, want, I knew I wanted to become a, a neurosurgeon. And so much so that uh, I used to go to the really fantastic library we had at uh, St. Mary's, 
uh, in the bottom section of the HSC corner mm -hmm. would be all these old anatomy books. Yes. And I would actually, you know, borrow some of those and go through them and read about You're all this me. brain anatomy. So you were there reading our <laughs> MBB books at a very tender age. At a very tender age. <laughs> and uh, some of my classmates uh, started to call me Sajon or Sajo. Oh. As, a, as, a, as a nickname. So, uh, now I know where that comes from. Okay. So that kind of picked up and, you know, it went without saying that I, I love the sciences uh, and not just the biological sciences, but also the engineering sciences, math, physics, EDCN. And, uh, and, 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 and yeah, that's how I pretty much uh, made my selection all the way to uh, Form 4, just focusing on building a science-based career. Yeah. Tremendous. That's our next song. When we return, it's how the high school turns out for you and into medical school. Yeah. So uh, for my next song, let's see. Uh, I'm a big fan of uh, Michael Chiwanuka. Ah. Uh, <laughs> is, I've always wanted to attend a concert of his. Uh, it, it's interesting how much talent we lose to people leaving the country. And sometimes it's not even in the generation that has gone, but in the generation that comes that after comes them. Yeah, especially for Michael Chiwanuka. Probably. Exactly, because you know his parents moved to the UK. He mm. Uh, you know, grew up there. He pretty much doesn't have much roots back home. But also, to imagine that really if the parents had stayed here, he possibly wouldn't be the same. Would have never been who he is. Mm -hmm. So I think you know, it it's just goes without saying that we need to learn to create this talent locally as much as we can and hone it, whether it's through our school system or mentorship or whichever way or exposure. So yeah, I'll play uh, "Love and Hate" by My Michael question. Chonoka. Let me just ask, and before you play the song, for you, if yeah. you had stayed in Southampton. <laughs> Would you be who you are, maybe down in Pompeii, just next door? <laughs> what would have been like for you? Uh, well, when you I close your eyes and imagine. Do you uh, think you'd have uh, been a better man, a different man? I was probably, t I would probably be too young to tell. But uh, another opportunity came in my adult life to mm -hmm. make that decision to stay or go, which we'll talk about. And uh, yeah, yeah. I chose to stay. <laughs> <laughs> Michael Chuanuka, <laughs> let's play that one when we return. It's more about Doctor Davis Musin's story. We'll be right back. Desert Island Discs. All right, still having this conversation with Dr. Davis Musingus, and I would prefer to call you Dr. Davis, but then I would get insulted when people call me Mr. Simon. I, I feel like I'm some... I, I tell my staff all the time, just call me Davis. Davis. Just call so me. can I assume that and just say for the remaining part of this sure, program, please. let's call you Davis. By all means. Great. So Davis, here you are, chatting your path through and clearly sending your clear signals towards the sciences. Mm. Did you ever evaluate the circumstances in which you would operate? Or for you, it was, let me go be a doctor. Hmm. Uh, because by that time, I'm sure yeah. the stories would come up yeah. in the press of how doctors are underpaid, how hospitals are breaking down, well, yeah. there are no facilities, and you possibly would lose a few relatives from the absence yeah. of not the too much presence of it. And you want to get in there. It's very interesting how you're so protected from that information as you're going to school. Oh. Normally, when you had a career guidance session, it's a very flowery oh, kind of yes. conversation. Um, <laughs> they call that marketing. <laughs> exactly. I think everybody is marketing their profession. And, and I think I didn't think so much about the practice of being a doctor. I think I was seduced by the knowledge of uh, medicine more than the practice at the time. Uh -huh. And for me, the knowledge was exciting. Just figuring out how the body works and also how the body fails. Or was was pretty and how exciting. to take it back to where it would work exactly and uh, yeah so that pursuit of medicine helped me make my choice for A level so it was a kind of difficult choice because uh, just as I was getting out of form four I started to get a real appreciation for the arts mm -hmm. I started studying literature uh, I, I, I got a D one in literature I just enjoyed that so much. If there was a way I could do PCB literature, I would have, done, have that. done that. <laughs> <laughs> and then also French. I took on French. I really loved uh, speaking French. And um, unfortunately, I also couldn't find room for it in my A-level choice. So I ended up doing physics, chemistry, biology, and mathematics, wow. which, which I all loved dearly. And also what was interesting at the time is I decided to make the switch uh, from SMAC to Budo. Why? Ah, uh, several reasons. The school was changing. Uh -huh. The school was changing. In a direction where I felt, you know, maybe I don't think I'm going to reach my fullest potential if everyone is going to have all these tight rules around 
what you can and can't do, how many clothes and pairs of clothes you should pack, what grub you can have and not have. Mm -hmm. uh, and yeah, I think somehow we led some kind of rebel movement. <laughs> I think that was the first time I realized I can <laughs> truly become a rebel. <laughs> <laughs> right, exactly. And, uh, you know, and back in SMAC, we used to wear short sleeves. So by the time we're getting done with our Form 4, we are now wearing the long sleeves, which the A-level students in Buddha would wear. Ah, and ah. would just fold those a little bit, just to kind of conceal that. But it made me realize that uh, sometimes uh, taking the road less traveled is the way to go. But then also what informed that is, uh, I thought Buddha would be a good transition. You know, maybe you now have more girls in the school. Mm, more girls, or now you have <laughs> girls. Now you actually have more girls that are not student teachers. Exactly. <laughs> And, uh, yeah, just also, you know, broadening your network, broadening your network. I thought it would be a good idea you to have a totally different of set of friends. just reminded me of this gorgeous student teacher that <laughs> can teach us biology in yes. SMAC. Mm. Uh, well, her teacher did it, you know, she was former exec deputy executive director of Kampala Capital City Authority. So oh, really? Yeah, she was a student teacher at the time when I was there. You were there from one. I, I, think, think, I yeah. think we did get some classes. And, whoa. Mm. I have to be yeah. sorry for another <laughs> I don't But you get the drift. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So there you so are so in so pursuit so of having those ones sitting right next to you, not before you as teachers. I, I, I think it also helps kind of uh, get boys used to having girls in their presence. True. There used to be a lot of excitement when girls would come for a oh, function. Yes. Extreme yes. excitement. People would, you know. It was extreme sport. All yes. the way from the main <laughs> gate. Us. You know. <laughs> everybody <laughs> screaming on top of their voices and. You know, all these kind of things and... and like we didn't have sisters, like we didn't have, you I, know... I, exactly, I grew, up in a, I grew up with a family of boys, Before I you came had to a boys' school, <laughs> and, and yeah, so I thought, you know, just some of that exposure would be a good thing for and my Budo. Did you meet your expectations? Whew, that was uh, <laughs> another, another culture story. shock, right? <laughs> so the fortunate thing was that uh, a couple of people shared the same kind of uh, idea about making that shift. Mm -hmm. So we were able to move with about 20 other Smackers, which was the biggest group of Smackers that had that ever... That was colonialism. That, the, <laughs> that was a like takeover. It was, it was a takeover. It was, it was some kind of takeover. Mm -hmm. And so the good thing is that I had some people that I knew very well uh, from, from my previous school. And your brother had left the school. And my so brother had already left the school. And some people I had gone to primary school with were also there. So somehow we also reconnected. Mm -hmm. So it was some familiar faces. But the culture was totally different. Uh, they were more affluent, uh, cared more about how they look, how they presented themselves, wow. uh, how they dressed, um, you know, what they had, how much people had in terms of wealth, I would wealth. say. Uh, but then also uh, they cared about their education so much so that they were very competitive and you know much as it may be frowned upon now uh, the, the girls and the boys used to really compete almost to a point where it wasn't very healthy wow. and uh, <laughs> i remember learning this one particular lesson from a classmate of mine uh, kaga maria you know rip oh and uh, she was the brightest female that i ever knew and she beat all these boys hands down each time time and again and i think also being exposed to being beaten by a girl that badly, <laughs> right, goes to show you that, you know what, they're actually smart people across mm -hmm. genders, across different social strat mm -hmm. strata, uh, that, you know, talent and knowledge and uh, cleverness can they come from anywhere. Exactly, they don't right? flow in. It doesn't flow in any particular gravitate. direction. It doesn't follow wealth or, you know, any, 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 anything like that. So just that exposure to a, a varied group of people and, you know, made friends uh, in all kinds of places. Sport, did you pick um, up cricket? Uh, <laughs> I tried. Uh, at least I tried to learn how they score. <laughs> yeah, that's very important. How no. they score. So I can watch a cricket game and actually enjoy it and understand. Those are not sticks. They are uh, wickets. Exactly. <laughs> what's going on and overs and you know, what exactly. it means to win by wickets and overs. <laughs> and and this. Exactly. And runs and, and things like that. Wow. But then also just, um, I think it was a good transition because there was some level of freedom. And um, it was a really interesting experience yeah, for me. Yeah. And of course... No doubt, you hit it for medical school. Yeah. Where are you admitted? I was admitted at Macquarie University. It was a very tight selection process. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Back then, you had to have some really crazy points uh, exactly. to get into medical school. I was very fortunate, you know, that I, I had a you know really uh, good group of people in my in my class that were very hardworking and. We all pushed each other to make sure we got the points needed to get onto a government scholarship. And mm -hmm. I was one of the fortunate few that was able to get onto uh, medicine on, on government scholarship. 
And that was an interesting po you know, kind of achievement for me because it meant my parents would never have to pay school fees again. For you ever again. Which for me meant that I would never have to give them a report card. Which also <laughs> meant that now you're a man on your own. A you, man on my own. You, yes. The accountability was yes. the report card. Yes. Now... E exactly. It's always, uh, I think, you know, being my own man has always been something that's important to me. So here yeah. at the university, of course, it's a different ballgame. It's, uh, well, similar to Budo, mm. but yeah. something out of this world. There's yeah. no bell ringing yeah. except the clock tower yeah. which yeah. well by, by the time you join dad stopped chiming mm -hmm. but you're on your own literally yeah. but with a very gruesome course yeah you have to go through katanga and go to medical school exactly how was it uh so i was in livingstone hall mm -hmm. and That's yeah close. we had to do that we had to do that trick uh, every day and with a lab coat <laughs> with our lab coat and trying to look all important and things and uh, mm -hmm. and so on but the time that we joined was very interesting we joined at a time that they had introduced a new system that they call problem-based learning, PBL. So what it meant is that you no longer had to sit in a lecture and have somebody present slides or notes and have people take notes in a class. What it meant is that at the beginning of every week, you were given a patient problem that was described and it had several different questions and you had to derive learning objectives from that as a small group of 10 or 12. So you're given a patient case. Uh, this maybe the course unit is the central nervous system. Mm -hmm. They describe for you a patient that is experiencing all these kinds of symptoms, maybe paraly paralysis and Parkinson's. brain damage or something like that. Mm -hmm. And you had to sit down as a group and try to flesh out all the issues about what may have caused this. And you come up with learning objectives or how it got treated, etc. And then you'd have to go back and study on your own, self-directed wow. learning. You'd have to go and study on your own and then come back as a group and discuss all your findings. And then present to the class. And present to the class and Ooh. present to each other. And, and that was mediated by or really uh, um, uh, moderated by a tutor. So the tutor would be your lecturer. So once every five weeks, you would have uh, a lecture showing you the entire breadth of the module. And then every week, you'd meet in your small group to do this problem-based learning thing. So it really taught me a lot about um, self-discipline and learning how to learn because different people have different ways of learning exactly. other people learn in groups other people learn in private other, other people, people want to, to discuss after the read. others and exactly and listen to that so i think we had some variation of that which i found most interesting but also uh, that i also had control of my time and my schedule that i didn't have to follow a clear uh, class schedule and i love that flexibility mm -hmm. yeah well the social scene University is not quite <laughs> <laughs> like Mundo. Uh, How was it for you there? Oh, were you totally absent? Like you were on a football pitch? <laughs> yeah, so um, I get to my second year and uh, my dad gets a job uh, in the US uh, with the IMF. And what that meant is uh, there was an opportunity for the family to go along with him. Uh, some of my siblings, uh, it was perfect, right? was about to sit from four and tab mm. ah, here's a chance to run away <laughs> off he went uh, another had just joined senior two off she went another had just joined chambo go first year off he went uh, i was right smack in the middle of medical school i decided mm -hmm. to stay but then as a result of that i got to drive the family car that they left ah behind. so i had the uh, i had and a, you the family house uh, well i was still in the livingstone home yeah but it was also available for you <laughs> the house well they rented that out oh, they rented okay. that out so, so I had the car, you know, old beaten up, you know, Corona, 1992 model, but, you know, with a carburetor, uh -huh. uh, really old type. And but you had it. I had it. And, of course, every time people wanted to go out, I was the one they looked to, like, uh -huh. take us out, stake out, all these other places. Mm -hmm. And uh, at the time, I really wasn't drinking, so I was the most sober guy, bringing Why? home Why the most... <laughs> Uh, you it's had a major I, I, drinking debut? Or? It wasn't a thing in our family. My, my dad didn't drink, my mom didn't drink, uh, neither of them smoked. Uh, neither of them seemed to have a really kind of social, outgoing lifestyle. Uh, but then, you know, when I really got to university, I think that's a thing that I kind of became quite curious about. Um, of course, during, you know, the earlier days before university, there would be one of those nights where you, you know, leave home, sneak out of home, mm -hmm. join the guys and you know, see what happens at Club Silk and Angenois and mm -hmm. that kind of thing. And now that you have this freedom, right, it was a real great opportunity to see what the nightlife is like. And it was also a great way to distress and meet new people and meet girls and uh, yeah. several other things and <laughs> exactly. have a good time. And so somehow, you know, trying to impress some girl, I think I tried to, uh, you know, I did a cocktail thing just to make it look like I actually do this kind of thing. And 
I guess that eventually graduated in one way or the other <laughs> and uh, now I like a nice good you know single malt whiskey wow. and <laughs> <laughs> a mix of two of <laughs> exactly right wow I should yeah. have known this earlier <laughs> <laughs> would have one on set exactly <laughs> <laughs> yeah and uh, you know kind of graduated into that and, and having fun with the guys and you know we had the car at our disposal and you know they would top up the fuel and would go out and you know have a good time and uh, find a way to safely make our way back Balancing that and some school, how was yes. that Yes, so uh, it was a delicate balance because, you know, medical school gets really busy. Mm -hmm. And uh, you have five years. So whereas everybody is now, you know, kind of peaking their campus experience, second, third year, you guys are starting to get into getting the thick of it. <laughs> so you're, you're trying to balance uh, having fun. You're trying to balance the intensity of school. Mm -hmm. um, but then again, also, like I explained, I was trying to be my own man. So I was trying to also make some money on the side. So, I, I, yeah, so um, my parents from 96 had been involved in a company called Neolife, GNLD, uh -huh. with food supplements. And somehow I got interested in nutrition. And I'd read up a lot about nutrition, I'd read up a lot about supplementation. So I thought, you know what, I could actually start advising people on which kind of supplements they need to take. And now that I had some kind of medical background or knowledge or whatever, you yeah, could help exactly, you, right? You were exactly. So I started selling uh, food supplements. Wow. And it got quite interesting because here I was in second, third year. I was making about a million shillings a month. What? From selling food supplements. And I'd built, you know, a pretty sizable sales client. network and client base. Uh, I had, a, I think, a team of about 100 or so people in my network and some customers that were buying from us routinely. And I kind of got good at sales. And involved with that was also learning a lot of leadership skills mm -hmm. and presentation skills. So every time the company would have, you know, kind of they would have these large showcase events where they would do these product showcases and walk people through the product and why they need to supplement and this pyramid of healthy eating and how we can't eat all the oranges. We need to get vitamin C and that's why you need a, <laughs> a vitamin C supplement. And I'll be the one up there doing these kind of pictures. And so I learned, you know, kind of presentation skills, public speaking skills, leadership skills, sales skills. And that really, really, really did help, you know, further down the line. Mm -hmm. But then, you know, as I started to get into the more clinical years, I realized, you know, I couldn't spend too much time here. Yeah. Hey, you've got to make sure that uh, we're well on course to finish this, this, this degree program. So you flipped. Uh, so so uh, at some point I had to say, you know, what, uh, you know money has to wait. Uh, it will always be there. But what it did is change my mindset. Exactly. Because here it was earning a million shillings and doctors that have finished their degree earning are, less earning, are earning less or just about that. I think mm -hmm. they were earning 800,000 shillings at the time. So for me, the decision to continue with medicine then wasn't really about, about the, the money because I knew the money could be made somehow, somewhere. Uh, it had to be more than just the money. And I think that's when I really started to pursue how we can you know, fix the healthcare system. Yeah. Now, that's very interesting. At that particular point, of course, you are beginning to stare right in the face yeah. of a broken down healthcare system. Yeah. You walk into Mulago and exactly. uh, it's cry and hue. Patients yeah. are just falling off, not because there are no doctors, but yeah. there's so much. But what That's struck, true. what stood out so bad for you, like a yeah. thumb, thumb in all this that you were saying? Yeah. I think for me, it was realizing how poor people actually are. People are so poor that they would only come to the hospital when their case is so far progressed and their life has been absolutely interrupted. Uh, that the only way they can get to the other side of it is put together all their money and come to the hospital. And by putting together all their money, you meant many of them sold everything they yeah, had yep. and uh, just came uh, with that which was not even sufficient. Exactly. And because they're presenting so late, the prognosis is poor, the treatment is expensive, they have to do all these things. And, you know, seeing, you know, kids on the ward, in the pediatric ward, I think for me that was actually my most trauma traumatic time. Pediatrics was, was pretty tough. Uh, other people say it was obstetrics. Oh, uh, <laughs> I was going to say that I think the, the most interesting one for you could have been uh, obstetrics. Uh, you know. Well, probably not. I think, I think for me, uh, after my obstetrics time, I was like, you know, I have absolute respect for every woman out there uh, because it's, it, it's, a, it's a special kind of existence mm -hmm. being a woman uh, and having to go through all Humanity of that. Humanity simply ruptures uh, out of them, you know. Like. E exactly. It's, a, it's a absolute respect for women. 
That's and, then, and then surgery, yeah, and then surgery, which was quite interesting. Surgery, which was very interesting. Yeah. What do you mean? I mean, there's this neurosurgery that they talk about you opening someone's brain and then you know, connecting yeah. all these loose yeah. connections. Then there's, of course, opening you know, your chest and checking out all these, yeah. the pulmonary and digestive systems. What stood out for you as the most intricate that you possibly thought you'd want to make? Mm, I, I thought uh, cardiac surgery was, was very interesting. Uh, there were a lot more heart disease cases that could be fixed by surgery, mm -hmm. but it just so happened that there were just not enough cardiologists, or maybe it was really complicated and we didn't have the infrastructure to do it. Or so not I kind enough pesetas for the heart. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So I got quite interested in, uh, in, in that. Um, and maybe at some point, I also got very interested in, in kidney surgery, things like transplants, and seeing that there are many people that could actually use these services but you know there either there's no regulation around donors uh, or mm. you know mm. human transplant organs and stuff like that wow so, so yeah, i got very interested in uh, nephrology which is really the study of the kidney yeah. let's play a third song yes my third song um hmm, okay we're going to go with uh beethoven uh moonlight so moonlight sonata uh, <laughs> you are, I, have, I have quite the bread. You have really, s uh, s you know, like swung us all through from, you know, your, your music. Yeah, yeah. Now classical music. Classical music. So, so, yeah, I, I got quite taken up by classical music, I think, during my time at medical school. Mm -hmm. I really got this compilation of classical music that I liked so much. Wolfgang Amazia. Uh, right? <laughs> to help me study, I would study listening to classical music. Uh, but then, you know, more than that, it also helps me get into a place where I can think about you know, choices I've made, choices I'm about to make, and uh, it's played off the piano, and I think if there's any instrument that I'd like to learn how to play, it's the piano. You haven't? Uh, no, I haven't. Uh, when I take a sabbatical, I will... Please carry <laughs> me on, because there's something about the piano, the piano that, that is, is so gorgeous. Exactly. And, and I don't think my fingers are musical yeah, we'll enough move, to... I, I, yeah. I think that, and the older I get, oh, yeah. the more steep I think the coordination <laughs> the between... The more you send the emails. <laughs> 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 exactly. Stuff they're going to give. <laughs> yeah, so uh, it, it puts me in a phase where I just, you know, kind of think very introspectively. And yeah. Wow. Yeah. Let's get into that space as well by listening to this beautiful one coming I mean, from Beethoven. It must have been composed in the <laughs> early 18th century, but we'll, yes. we'll get the museography up around it, you know, shortly when we return. Thank you very much. We'll be right back. Yes. Desert Island Discs. Welcome back to the program. It's Dr. Davis Musingzi sharing with us his life story, the guy of Rocket Thought. I'll just put it simply like that. But they do quite some incredible work. His life story, even more incredible. Mm. So Davis, here you are. You are on your own, mm -hmm. family-wise. Your siblings <laughs> are off your parents to the US. You are studying a gruesome course, and now you're concluding it. So where did your internship throw you? Well, that's also a really interesting story. Mm -hmm. I chose not to do internship. What? <laughs> you just said I'll go straight into uh, making experiments where my patients are the specimen. <laughs> <laughs> no, well, it, mm. was, it was a very interesting choice. So after I'd done my five years, like I told you, I'd gotten to a point where it wasn't going to be about the money. So, mm -hmm. you know, when you've studied for five years, you know, like even longer than that, right? You've done your secondary school. It has never been up to you to choose what happens next. Exactly, yeah. Right? The you, system always chose for the you. The system <laughs> always chose for you. You move from you know, primary to O level to A level to campus. I was like, hold up, hold up, hold up. I need to take a break mm -hmm. and just figure out where but exactly we're going. Mm -hmm. right? So um, I was supposed to start my surgery rotation. And I, you know, I just put in a letter and said, you know, I have the option to start again in three months. And I'll just postpone it for three months and um, just figure out where my head is at so that I can make a choice. Because if you make a choice in the medical profession, that choice is going to cost you another four or five years of school or study or whichever direction you choose. So I decided to take a, a sabbatical. Mm -hmm. uh, and that sabbatical ended up lasting one year. Your lecturer, or should they call them dean, uh, were they not so <laughs> unimpressed with you? That of course, my parents weren't impressed with me. Well, uh, at least they could only My do friends so thought remote. I was crazy. <laughs> they knew you had lost it. Uh, exactly. But, you know, very special things happened during that time. Mm -hmm. And I think this is also where life choices, you know, really get very interesting. So I 
I, I start looking out for interesting things to do. I get involved with um, a program being uh, advertised uh, in the newspaper uh, called Inspire Africa. Mm -hmm. Right? We remember that on TV. Exactly. It was a fantastic TV show. Uh, would love to do it again or, you know, recreate it in one way or another. And what they were looking for was entrepreneurs that had an idea that they thought would be transformative. And if they were the right entrepreneur for their idea, they would fund your idea for up to $50,000. Wow. Now, you see, I was like, you know, here I am. I've always been trying to fix the healthcare system. This, this is my chance. Mm -hmm. So I say, you know, I'd, um, I'd always been a big fan of The Apprentice. Exactly. Uh, I'd always you watched. You fired. <laughs> <laughs> right? Regardless of what happened to him or, later on or, in life. Or you got fired up <laughs> by The Apprentice. <laughs> I used to love The Apprentice. So much so that uh, I had a, a, an, an OB of mine that was studying university in South Africa, in Cape Town. And he would download. They had much better internet. In, in exactly. Asia. So he would download it using torrents, burn it for me on disk, and, and send it to me via post. Wow. And uh, I would receive it via post and I would watch all these uh, shows. So you always say maybe two seasons ahead of all of us here e waiting e for it. E yeah. Exactly. <laughs> so, yeah, I would spend sleepless nights just watching who's going to get fired next, what, you know, what, what the task is going to be and, you know, things like that. So when I heard about this Inspire Africa thing that was going to be this reality TV show that was structured, you know, in very much the same way, I was like, of course, yes, I want to do this. You so put in your so I applied, I put in my application, I made it to the top 30. Then Did I you have an idea in mind or you just went for the first time? I had it? an idea in mind. We had already, I had already started conceptualizing. I think at that time it was just me. Mm -hmm. At that time I started conceptualizing what personalized healthcare would look like. And I was thinking to myself, why can't healthcare be a concierge service? Mm -hmm. Why can't a doctor come to you? Because that's how it used to be back in the old days. The doctor would have his briefcase, have all these tools inside there, he would come to your home, he would check you out, check out the kids, he was known in the neighborhood. And though it was relational more exactly. than it was transactional, transactional now. now. Exactly. And I wanted to bring back that relational kind of thing back into healthcare and figure out a way that we could transform healthcare beyond just the confines of the hospital. Because maybe someone would argue that you are trying to take the, con the word back <laughs> in time, right? <laughs> way past yeah. doctors showing up. I, I think from the time that I spent uh, working in uh, hospitals out of the country, I did some time in Anaka Hospital, I learned that a lot of healthcare really happens in the community. And until we can fix it in the community, we're always going to struggle with healthcare at a hospital, at a hospital. level. Because I think in the community, it's about prevention. It's about doing the right exactly things. Exactly, doing the right And also things. being able to tell when yeah. you should come to the hospital. Not exactly. to wait until exactly. they can only really bring you on a stretcher. Exactly. So it, it became, I think, for me, very, a, a very kind of passionate thing to pursue uh, fixing healthcare at a household, individual, community level. So that's how we thought about it. And that's the idea that I pitched. And I think it resonated that, you know, here is a doctor coming to pitch a transformative way in healthcare and he seems to have his business acumen somewhere Some in there yeah, exactly. right because of you know my previous background in, in in sales and all these other things and somehow i made it into the five ugandans that were selected to participate amongst other east africans from kenya rwanda tanzania and and yeah and the rest. it's one of the things that one can say ended in tears for you so how did it end in <laughs> <laughs> well it was a really interesting experience one because i got to travel mm -hmm. i'd always wanted to travel so we had some tasks that were done in, uh, in Mombasa, in Dar es Salaam, in Kigali. So it gave me time to travel, uh, doing all these different competitive tasks. Uh, I won, I think, six out of seven of the tasks wow. I was involved with. I won all the tasks where I was a, a team leader. And we got to the finals. And I, this is now the interesting part, is that there were two different, there was the main prize from the show. And I didn't make the main prize uh, for the show, but one of the sponsors was so delighted with uh, my performance mm -hmm. and they decided to match the main price. And this was already Telecom at the oh. time. Mm -hmm. uh, so they gave me 50,000 US dollars to start my business. Wait a minute. So you're a young 20-something-year-old yeah. guy and you're staring at $50,000. Yeah. I'm 25 years old $50, and I just have one meeting with them just to explain to them everything, uh, what I'm going to do with the money. And before I knew it, it was on your account. It was on my account, 125 million Uganda shillings at the time. 
So guess what? The bank mm -hmm. decides to block my account. <laughs> yeah, exactly, because I mean, they've never seen this. <laughs> what, the bank wasn't well, watching this show? Uh, <laughs> I was like, uh, if you're not ready for me to have this kind of money, maybe you're not ready to be my banker. <laughs> so you also left the bank? So I also left the bank. <laughs> with your money or without with your With the money. So I'm taking my money with me. Uh, yeah, no, I, 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 yeah. Because, I mean, yeah, they blocked the account without notifying me and then I... I had to go through this whole process of giving them supporting documentation for the trial. Of course, I understand it better now mm -hmm. that, you know, there are things like money Financial, laundering and yeah. terrorism financing. And of course, back, back then, what, what did I know, really? Even know? me, if you block <laughs> my account, and I'm 25, yeah. 125. Exactly, Whoa. right? You want to... You, exactly. So, mm -hmm. yeah. the first withdraw out of it. <laughs> what do you do with it? Now, that's also the interesting thing, right? Yeah. You see the zeros, but then you have to withdraw it to believe it. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah, so... Uh, so, so interesting things happen so um, first of all I realized that I'm not I can't quite go into business alone uh, it's not the best approach uh, so what I decided to do is to raise almost the same amount of money from a couple of colleagues of mine that were also working at the time uh, to be able to get started in the business with me so that we could match uh, for that yeah, but yeah, then yeah. but then of course I also needed to make sure that I'm in a certain place personally uh, where I don't have to worry too much about you know, whether I have a cook at home or a mm -hmm. microwave. So I, I, I did a bit of that. I did a bit like of that. Like you say in language, we're <laughs> Suit yourself I to look at the part. Hey, look the part uh, so, yeah, so I sorted you, out a couple of personal affairs. You, you replaced the old family can't want to believe. Uh, 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 yeah, that one, yeah, that one, that one got, that one stayed for a bit and then eventually got sold off. Mm -hmm. Yes, and uh, what happened at the time is that I learned how to ride a motorbike mm -hmm. and I got really into biking, so... I bought myself a motorbike after the car was sold. Harry Davidson? Mm. <laughs> <laughs> I got myself a nice good Honda, you uh -huh. know, one of those cruiser types where your yeah. legs out there and... Uh, <laughs> looking like yeah. the renegade. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, looking like the renegade. I actually <laughs> called it, uh, I called the, car, uh, the first motorbike I bought, the Rebel. Oh, wow. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, so I pretty much rode for, for the longest time after that. Didn't quite much use the car. So, yeah, so took care of a couple of those things. Also, very interesting, I also took a road trip with my friends before we started the business. I was like, you know what, we need to go on a road trip. So, so who are these friends? You well, yeah, so I have some really interesting friends. So at the time, I, I went on a road trip with uh, Colin Asimo. You may know him. Mm -hmm. He's in advertising. He's an ad man. <laughs> I know uh, Yeah, I also had a very good friend. She's a playwright, uh, Angela Amaron. Mm -hmm. um, she's, she's done some BBC award-winning uh, screenplays. Mm -hmm. um, I also have uh, some other friends that uh, joined me much later in life. Um, yeah. So you go detox so we go we do this road trip uh we go we're, we're shooting for mozambique wow yeah we are told that uh, the beaches of mozambique are like nothing else oh yes a bit so, so we have like we have to go to mozambique mm -hmm. so so we drive to nairobi we drive through uh tanzania tanzania, tanzania is massive oh yes you uh, go for you know we're crossing the border and we tell the guy we're crossing the kenya border and we're mountain. going uh, we're, so we're going all the way down to the malawi border in bear which is you know over a thousand kilometers away like, yeah, you think you're going to do that trip in, uh, one, in day? one day? Yeah, a thousand and Tumbafu miles is what you said. <laughs> 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 yeah, so, uh, I can only imagine. Beautiful that, yeah. scenery across <laughs> Tanzania, driving through game parks. We get into Malawi. Uh, a friend of ours had, we had a friend uh, who had a friend in Malawi where we stayed, and we really enjoyed Malawi, the beautiful Lake Malawi, uh, unadulterated natural beaches. And we just wow. said, you know what, this is good enough for us. We stay We've here. driven 8,000 kilometers to get here. Mm -hmm. let, let's stay here, let's chill, let's enjoy ourselves. So you miss checking out the Palona uh, in Mozambique. We, we miss <laughs> checking it out. So uh, it's still on my, it's still on my list. And, uh, you know, made lifelong friendships. Uh, Colin married his wife uh, that he traveled with uh, at the time. And yeah. Wow, interesting. So when is the medical concierge group getting to get born? Yes, yeah, so we incorporate in November of 2012. This group of guys that take the road trip. Yes, yeah, so, <laughs> so, so uh, I had started already hinting on the idea uh, with a couple of colleagues of mine. So mm -hmm. Dr. William, uh, he was one of the smartest guys that I ever knew in school, William Lobega. He was a year ahead of me. Uh, we used to revise his past papers. Ah. To sit there. You know, there were always those guys, right? You'd revise his papers. It to sit there, your current exam. Exactly, right? He was one of those guys. So he's very smart. And our guy was Dr. John Mark. I met him in Budo, also a year ahead of me. Uh, really smart, diligent guy. He did uh, his, they, they both studied as doctors, William at McCary, uh, John Mark in, uh, in Imbara. Okay. Uh, and then also during my work at UNICEF, I worked for UNICEF at some point. Uh, that's how I also met another lady called Hope Achiro. Pharmacist, and then also interested in starting the business 
and and that's pretty much how we you know got started and um, in 2012 put the company together did a bit of work around how what we would launch how would launch what would launch and then in August of we 2013 advertising guy yeah. on the team so yeah. he knew how to play around August 2013 we, we, we launched the company and uh, we had the, the Minister of Health come and officiate that we're very keen on uh, creating those kind of collaborations very early on and and then that's how it pretty much got started and within the first six months 7,000 people had used the service and we needed to figure out what the business plan actually is going to be because now it was much bigger than right? you thought it was going to exactly be. right we had invested our own money we were paying you know salaries of the doctors who are answering the calls we were not charging any fee at the time uh, so it was a free consultation uh, you just had to make a phone call or use whatsapp which you introduced later on and so where would you make the money from uh, the sales of the medicines, the thank so, yous. So, so at that time, it was just consultation only. So we thought we had all these, you know, lofty ideas mm -hmm. that you know, you know, you know how you have like uh, this IVR, or when you call into a call center, there's this recorded, pre-recorded mm -hmm. voice you hear. So we thought we'd actually place ads in there. You know, these Ministry ah. of Health ads. Please wash your hands. Uh, please and use a condom. Please take your ARVs or family plan. So we thought we would sell that as advertising space. And they didn't come that uh, they didn't come and when that business plan kind of fell through uh, we started scrambling to figure out okay how else are we going to do it can we charge uh, the users to pay but then that was also quite cumbersome things our mobile money were not quite there yet and then of course the telcos were not coming on board to a exactly and people weren't quite catching on and you know after nine months we ran out of money yeah, you could have. and you know we went about three months without you know paying salaries and we are very fortunate that you know we got some early adopters that said, you know what, if you can create for me content that you can uh, give some of the people that I want to call in, and also be able to send them some of this content via SMS, I'd actually be willing to pay for that. Mm -hmm. cool. So that's how we got our first customer. It was a company called Text to Change. Uh, so they were in the digital health space, and they were focused on uh, delivering information to their target beneficiaries. That included TB patients, HIV patients, and so on. So that's how we got our first client. And then we realized, okay, the opportunity is really in extending this telemedicine service to, to development beyond. agencies, to people in hard to reach areas that need this content and information. Mm -hmm. And what we could do is to build these development agencies to provide that service. So that's ah. how we really started to make uh, some money. So the USAID. Exactly, USAID projects. Uh, also, clinical research was also a very interesting category. Mm -hmm. So you would have a thousand patients in a clinical research study. You can't have all of them coming into the uh, facility, the facility yes. just because their pee has turned yellow. Mm -hmm. right? Now they can just call into the doctor or the doctor can follow them up, get all this information, keep them on their medication, improve their adherence. So we really started to make a name for ourselves in you know, patient, uh, patient care remotely uh, in to people in hard to reach areas and also target populations of public health concern like HIV, TB, expectant mothers and so on. Wow. Yeah. And, and yeah, the contract started coming in and for five years we pretty much did just that. And then what got interesting is that a lot of the people that use the service now started to ask, okay, yes, I'm getting the consultation, you've given what me a is? prescription, but where's your pharmacy? I want to come and buy. Uh -huh. Oh, you've said I should go and do this lab test. Where are you located? I want to come to your location and test. I really love the service. You guys have given it to me for free. How can I pay for this lab test or this uh, pharmacy prescription? And that was when we decided, okay, now it's time to broaden our horizon. Mm -hmm. We tracked what the demand is going to be over three years. We noticed how much money we could possibly make if we set up our own pharmacy and our own lab. So we went out looking for investors. And uh -huh. Guys bring in the money. Yeah, and we're very fortunate that we found a, a, a really great investor uh, that, that, that helped us set up the pharmacy and the lab for a high net worth individual introduced to us by another friend of ours, and that's how we became Rocket Health. Sorry if I'm being a bit intrusive, but are we yeah. saying this investor lives with us here? <laughs> no, foreign. He's Australian, uh, lives in Hong Kong, had come to Uganda just as a tourist to escort a friend of his. His friend was doing some investments in the region, so he sat into this session where what people would normally call a pitch day or a demo day, and he's listening to all these great businesses mm -hmm. that he thinks would make a whole lot more money, but they're just looking for capital. And the kind of capital they're looking for was it's kind pocket of pocket change, change for him. Uh, he had made you know, quite a lot of money in what you call the futures market or the commodities market trading. And uh, I think you know, during you know, the 2008 crisis and thereafter, they, they made so much money, their farm got bought, and you know, most of them cashed out really well. 
and some of them continued doing that and so he had this extra money on his hands and he was starting to look for now businesses across East Africa after that experience that he could invest in. So he's invested in quite a lot of businesses actually, probably yeah. 15 to 20 businesses in Uganda wow. alone or East Africa I think. So you were lucky yeah. to be on very this chopping board. Very, very lucky and uh, yeah and, and when he did come on board he provided a lot of insight and you, you know very fortunately because of these USAID programs we've been a part of things like corporate governance and due diligence were processes that we had already been through. So at least we had a lot of that kind of documentation, mm -hmm. which is very important if you're, if you're raising money from foreign investors or institutional investors. And yeah, that's how we set up you know, the, the, what we have. And to date, we have probably invested over a million dollars in this business. I also noticed from reading about you on your LinkedIn page that you have an MBA from Strathmore Business School. Yeah, so uh, <laughs> what you thinking of going to study money? Uh, yeah, very interesting story. So, so I realized at some point. So we, I'm d running the business part time. I also had uh, a, a job with UNICEF at the time mm -hmm. in digital health, helping public healthcare systems adopt electronic systems. So for their medical records, for public health surveillance, etc. And uh, what I learned from that is, you know, there are all these people in tech that want to do stuff in healthcare. And healthcare guys need the tech. Mm -hmm. uh, but what's not happening is nobody's Bridge. building a sustainable business model around these kind of things. And that's when I went to study business. And I got an MBA in healthcare management from the Strathmore Business School, fantastic business school. And also got a master's in IT from uh, uh, Nkosi, sorry, uh, Uganda Christian University Nkosi. Uh, is it Uganda Christian University? Yeah. Uganda yeah. Matters. Matters. Sorry, Uganda, Uganda Matters, Matters University. And uh, they had a really nice program that they had blended in with uh, a university in the SA. So here it was, so I thought, you know, with my medical knowledge, with my business knowledge, with my I IT see. knowledge, I have everything that I need to really direct where the business goes. But what's happening in your private life? Are you getting married? Are you having <laughs> children? What's happening there? Are you getting too busy? Uh, well, what was going on around that time? Uh, that, that, that's always been an interesting thing for mm. me. Uh, you know, relationships are not something you can necessarily get better results when you work harder. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah, they follow that it's, it's more nuanced. <laughs> and uh, I'm, I'm very lo logical, very rational. Uh, and I think, you know, when it comes to matters of the heart, people need you to you be don't more. You don't use uh, here. You, you need to. Uh, <laughs> 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 yes, I also, well, there was, there was a couple of stories of unrequited love mm -hmm. in there, like any young, young man growing up. We all uh, have always a, that. A list. Uh, <laughs> there's always that first cut is the <laughs> deepest kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I tried in. I, tr I tried several times. Um, you know, for some people that interested me, some things didn't work out mm. as I thought they would. But I think I also put that on a break after a while, and then I think after the business got busy, you just get occupied with work. It becomes one of those things you just focus on making friends and you know getting to know people better. And yeah, and not married yet. Uh, I have a daughter in Nairobi. Ah, tremendous. Uh, very From Strathmore uh, Business School, right? Uh, another <laughs> whole other story there, <laughs> yes. But uh, <laughs> I thought you picked an uh, MBA. Uh, yeah, well, another then. story there. So I have, uh, I have a daughter with uh, two African names, Wamboi and Musimenta, my other names. So. Ah, tremendous. Uh, yeah, so uh, five years old, you know, growing wow. up very well. And uh, yeah, and also started a relationship uh, almost, well, coming close to a year now. So Good luck I with guess that. It's, uh, <laughs> it's all coming together. Yeah, when we return on this day, you'll be telling <laughs> us what happened to that one <laughs> and, and all that. We'll play our yeah. next song, yeah. Davis. When we return, it's now the prospect of the future, mm. where we can easily tell where this business is headed. Yeah. But what about you? And then, of course, we'll get to yeah. know about the things that really are so personal around you. Your favorite dish, how you prefer to mm. wash it down, I know, single <laughs> Or what else? So, let's play yeah. that song. Well, uh, well, now you're talking about matters of the heart. <laughs> 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 I exactly. guess it's uh, I guess a good time to have a song somehow related to that. I think uh, Ugandan music is very lyrical, uh, unlike I think most other African music, and especially when they're speaking about matters of the heart. Exactly. And you know the way weddings are set up these days, where mm -hmm. there's an entourage that comes in with this song and these dance moves and. <laughs> uh, yeah, I thought that if I ever do get married, I think a song that I'd like to probably be my entrance song would be. Uh, uh, Bolijita by Fim for Michael. Ah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, nice. Uh, yeah, I, I, it's a really nice tune. If there's anyone that's taken out through a musical journey on the program, <laughs> you just <laughs> all over the place. Very yeah. unpredictable. Yeah. But we now know that you yeah. love your music from wherever it comes from and the inspiration for which you're an incredible guy. We'll be right Thanks. back. Bolijita <laughs> by Fim for Michael. Just a
Welcome back. It's uh, Davis sharing with us his life story. It's an incredible life story. I mean, what more can we say? Right. But let's get down now to you. We've seen the transformations you have made in your career and all that. You know, you made a deliberate decision. You won't go for medical practice, you know, for, for internship, mm -hmm. which, like the lawyers, is like the LDC, right? Exactly, yes. So you don't, you've never gone to do your medical LDC? So no, so no, I haven't. So what is interesting is this. So on the other hand, I also thought, you know what, being a medical professional is very fragile. One, because it's a very licensed profession. Mm -hmm. And what that means is that anything can cause you to lose your license mm -hmm. that you may not have anticipated or for whatever reason. Meaning that your entire career can be ended abruptly. Yeah, you just walking on eggshells. Exactly, and you, you're constantly walking on eggshells. And being the robot that I am, I'm sure that I would have found myself in some scenario where <laughs> somebody would want to use that against me or mm -hmm. I'd have some kind of anxiety about losing a license. And I think because I wanted to be very innovative in healthcare, I needed to kind of free myself from that the shackles of, of that shackle of regulation, regulation. Uh, mm -hmm. so that I could, you know, freely and truly express how I'd like to build uh, healthcare from the ground up digitally. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, I think it has let me run with certain ideas in a way that, you know, other people may not be able to do because maybe they are concerned about uh, some of these things. And I'm, and I'm glad it has worked out very well, but. Uh, all my other colleagues uh, are, you know, are very well licensed and, you know. So you cannot check my prostate, but they can. They can, yes. For you, you yeah. can. I'll not do surgery. That is the, pretty, the, the knowledge is, you know, something that you're constantly acquiring. Uh, it's, yeah. But, when but from a regulatory point of view, you can walk into... I will not sit in a consultation room and handle you and say, I'm your doctor and you're the patient. How long does it take for you to do that? Why don't you also just have that as part uh, of the package? You know, or you're still rebellious? Think, think, things have moved on. Now mm. I'm more involved in management, growing the business. Uh, I'd only do it to practice. Really, it's all it gives you. Mm -hmm. right? Just and so that you can there's everyone around size up somebody's <laughs> prostate. <laughs> but, <laughs> but other than that, uh, I think, like I told you, I think I was more seduced by the knowledge than I was about the practice. The practice yes. I saw how many doctors live their lives and you know, I thought, you know, th th surely there must be a better way to live. And, and I think kind of trying to create this telemedicine experience is also trying to create a new experience for every other doctor that came after me that you can choose how you want to practice. But also medicine. it's interesting for you, especially young people watching us, to yeah. know that you can actually practice something exactly. that you have never studied. Exactly. I mean, you, can be, you can be in a profession and... Uh, there are very many ways to be in an industry. Um, and I think just figuring out how you want to participate in that industry I don't know if I would have been really a better interviewer if I'd yeah. gone to journalism school. But mm, I didn't. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Look, same thing, right? Um, I don't know what kind of doctor I would have been if mm. I had gone to medical, medical school. school. Well, after we don't being know admitted that. for vet, yeah. <laughs> 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 I would have been busy eating my clients. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so I think you know, everybody needs to have the courage to make the tough calls mm -hmm. about uh, what you're passionate about, what you want to pursue. And you know, even if everybody seems like you know, it's not the right call to make, I think now we can say that if I had done internship, I'd have never gotten onto Inspire Africa. Exactly. I'd have never gotten the money to start the business. I'd have never gotten my colleagues on board, would never have Rocket Health as we know it today. And so sometimes some of these things work for the best. These are conversations you had on the table with your father? Uh, unfortunately not. <laughs> <laughs> And that's also because uh, <laughs> I, I, I always felt like uh, career decisions were always going to be my decisions. Not it, it, it not, no, I was not going to live Looking anybody's life. Looking back at the benefits life. of hindsight, are they happy? They are. Because the, the, the business serves them so well. <laughs> 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 serves them so well. They're so proud to just tell any of their friends that ask them with a medical issue, ah, my son, my you son, know, just it, it, start to 80 hash. <laughs> 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 uh, he'll sort you out. Wow. Uh, exactly. So they've, they've referred the business to a lot of their friends who you know, maybe need chronic care medication, need mm -hmm. lab tests done at home. Maybe their kids are too busy. Their kids can't come pick them up, take mm -hmm. them to the lab, take them to the hospital. So we'll just take all of that work and uh, be able to implement that for them. Yes. Wow. Yeah. What's your favorite dish, Doctor? Ooh, uh, katogo of uh, yes. <laughs> Granuts, uh, yeah. Katogo of granuts. Uh, uh, what's the other? Sweet potatoes, yams, or matoke? What, what's on the other part? Of what's it? on the other side <laughs> of it? That's all there is. <laughs> <laughs> That's all there is. Uh, I think I, I, I liked it a lot growing up, and I think that kind of stayed with me. Mm -hmm. um, I'll also like chicken. Um, I'll have chicken any day. 
in whichever, one, shape <laughs> whichever shape or form. Whichever shape or form. There's the anti-hangover version. The one that comes uh, that, in a bowl. Uh, that of one, soup. Huh? <laughs> Or the one you find at Chengera, or the one that comes in a bowl of soup. You want and, this one uh, here, you're right uh, in your face. Eh? Exactly. There's also <laughs> that one. It doesn't matter what, what kind of chicken it is, whether it's, uh, you know, filet or whatever, or strips or... Wow. I just, I just. Well, yes, the wings themselves. Or wings themselves. Uh, Drumsticks. Yeah. Whether it has breadcrumbs <laughs> or, yeah, chicken is. Chicken Apart is from a single malt whiskey, how would you prefer to wash down that chicken? Ah, uh, yeah. So, uh, an owl special is a good one. Ah, that's <laughs> good. You take them uh, in high octane. Eh? <laughs> I, I think I like, uh, I like some things aggressive. Yeah, wow, yeah, I know. Yeah, I like some things aggressive. But you burst out a very hearty laughter every so often. <laughs> what gives you a good laugh? Uh, I think. You know, life is to be lived. Um, True. And there will always be stuff happening around you. Happiness is a choice you have to make despite of everything happening around you. Wow. It's a space that you need to protect. Uh, and I think, you know, going through life can't take everything too seriously. Otherwise, the stress will, you know, kind of just blow the wind out of you. So. Yeah, so uh, I, I try to have a good time, have to have a good laugh. Uh, my friends and I normally like to meet often. So Andrew, David Ogutu, who has also been in the media mm -hmm. space, his oh wife, yeah. um, Eugene, and a couple of other friends, uh, Colin, that I mentioned earlier. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we like to sit down sometimes and just have a pretty good laugh. And Next uh, time you're drink. sitting down, please invite us. We'll yeah. be glad to be there, not yeah, to exactly. the cameras. <laughs> <laughs> no microphones. Yeah. What Andrew. gets you angry? What, what gets me angry? Angry. Ooh, um, that, that's a very interesting thing. I'm yeah. very slow to anger. Mm -hmm. um, I've always found anger to be a wasteful emotion. It, it burns energy, it, it breaks you down, it, it, it's more toxic to you, the person getting angry, than the person you're getting angry at. Right. And they possibly don't even know, they're in blissful ignorance of how you e feel. E exactly, and also that's another interesting... And maybe they've also decided they're going to anger you. So they exactly, are. and when somebody has positioned themselves <laughs> to anger you, there's <laughs> nothing you're going to do about it. And because I was a kid growing up with glasses, I didn't afford the luxury of getting angry with people and getting, and getting into a fist fight, fight at, the, <laughs> at the behind the class. Exactly. Uh, so I had to stay out of fights. So I, I couldn't afford to express anger uh, in that way. So I had to get more uh, conversational about things like that, uh, negotiate, uh, try to be understanding. If I thought things were getting out of hand, I'd either just leave the space, leave the room. Uh, wow. And so on. So I, I, it's I could get pissed off. Well, people say that I will speak in a very stern, uh, <laughs> piercing kind of way. But uh, look at them. You look as at if them. Looking at them like a <laughs> <story>. <laughs> well, I guess the staff may, you know, kind of tell that story differently. Uh -huh. But yeah, they know when I'm not smiling. And yeah, but uh, I, I try never to raise my voice. Uh, I, I don't like being shouted at, and I'll never really shout at anybody else. I, I just can't take people shouting at me so wow yeah it, it's not a space or a person I'd want to deal with if they do that so yeah I'm very slow to anger and that's pretty much how I deal with it we've gone into a space where on the program now we get people to tell us just that one thing mm. about them that nobody until now <laughs> knows about them. I think uh, my girlfriend knows everything about me <laughs> <laughs> Think, think uh, again, think well, well, I'm sure uh, you know P Penny somewhere has uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> connections <laughs> <laughs> in places that I know nothing about. Oh, uh, but let me see what what would that be? Um, it could hmm. be a blast from the past. Hmm. 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 Well, okay, maybe maybe one interesting story I, I probably haven't told anyone. So I was very fortunate in 2019 before this COVID thing happened. Mm -hmm. um, uh, before COVID-19 happened, I managed to, I'd always wanted uh, to go for a Rugby World Cup. And I was very fortunate at the time to go to Japan for a Rugby World Cup. Wow, to stand in the stands. To be in the stands and watch the All Blacks and mm -hmm. watch uh, the Springboks and all of those guys. So it's one night, J Japan is playing, it's a really good, really good game. We have way too much to drink because, you know, beers are always flowing at these games. Mm. And I get to the hotel room, I crash. I wake up in the morning and I'm feeling totally hangover. Totally hangover, but you're in a random city. There's nobody you know. Uh, you can barely get out of bed to get a panado. You don't even know how to ask for a panado in Japanese. Uh -huh. And I was, I, was, I was very low on sugar. Uh, yeah, so I, I pretty much had to, uh, you know, literally groping 
<laughs> to find a supermarket so I get some sugar, get some painkillers. Uh, that's when I said, you know what? Uh, yeah, easy on these games. Uh, and this kind of <laughs> <laughs> yeah, don't go, don't get taken up drinking. Don't try drinking with South Africans. So. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I think before they get in there, they first yeah. ship head and yeah. then get this. Exactly. That's for you. Drink, you're not drink taking it out the table. Yeah. So wow. yeah, I think uh, if you're traveling alone, I think you just need to be a little bit more careful, more tempered. Uh, yeah, interesting story right there. Now we yeah. know. <laughs> for a guy that has traveled over eight thousand kilometers yeah. with friends just on yeah. a road trip just to yeah. check out and take yeah. in the beauty of nature. Yeah. Which part of this beautiful country would you love wow. to be marooned in and why? I was very fortunate to have, uh, well, two things happened to me. I worked for UNICEF at the time and I was traveling, visiting all these different health facilities across the country. And I got to see a lot of the countryside, which you know, many Ugandans, if you have not had the pleasure of doing, please uh, definitely, definitely, lived. definitely do it. And then also I had the other pleasure of being a part of a traveling group called Koi Koi. Wow. And Koi Koi had this team of photographers and they would travel the country and tell all these really wonderful stories and take all these uh, screenshots of, of all these places. Sunsets and I think and sunrises. Exactly. And One place that I would always love to go back to would be the Crater Lakes in Fort Poro. Yeah, that I would, I'd, I'd buy a piece of land. I'd buy a hill if I could afford it and just have a cabin overlooking a, a so crater lake. Yeah. Don't count that as <laughs> it's coming your way. Yeah, the crater lakes and the weather and the, the peace, the calm, the Fort Porto is a, is a great place for me. Dr. Davis, Masin, it's been a pleasure having you on the program. Yeah. Thank Even you more much. that we have taken an hour of your time yeah. away from dealing with the ever-pressing uh, issues of our yeah. nation. Great. Do we see Rocket Health, a Pan-African outfit, or are you going to keep yourself restrained to the Ugandan border? We're growing as fast as we can, mm -hmm. and uh, we look at what we have as an African solution to healthcare. The profile for the kind of diseases we experience, the kind of challenges we experience within the healthcare system, broken and fragmented as it is through the patient experience and also through the patient data, mm -hmm. and also through how we can you know, knit all these things together to make healthcare more accessible, more affordable, uh, of the kind of quality that we need to achieve the desired health outcomes. We really see Rocket Health as an African business. And if you look at our domain name for our website, it's rockethealth.africa. Wow. Because we have an African dream uh, for healthcare that we are, we are going to digitize and smoothen out the healthcare value chain so that everybody benefits, not just the patient, but the doctor, uh, uh, the, the healthcare facilities, the insurers that we work with, the governments that we work with, the manufacturers, the distributors. We are using technology to really optimize the entire experience and outcomes for everyone involved. Beautiful. Yeah. For you, our viewer and listener, I couldn't have thanked you more, especially for, again, taking time off what else you could have been doing at this particular time, but to watch these incredible life stories. Mm -hmm. If for nothing else, the inspiration comes out of it. But for David here, I think we've gotten more than just inspiration. Swinging across music genres. <laughs> talking about music, uh, this is your chance to say Kwaheri to our listeners. Uh, a beautiful song. What will be your last song? One last song, one last song. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, I thought about this one. Mm -hmm. um, Frank Sinatra. <laughs> He's, uh, <laughs> now you're taking us down the 60s. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Frank Sinatra. <laughs> Yes, uh, if anybody doesn't really know Frank Sinatra, watch the Netflix documentary that is on Frank Sinatra and you'd know that he's lived a very illustrious life on, on the social scene, at a personal level, uh, in what he was able to achieve. Uh, he really lived life uh, to the fullest uh, in every sense of the word. And um, he did a song that he called My Way uh, by Frank Sinatra. And I think it you know, goes to say a lot of things about you know, when the you story is done and told. Uh, that Everything was done. I did way. it my way. Yeah. <laughs> what a way to end <laughs> this program on a Sunday evening. Yeah. His way, my way, <laughs> your way, whichever yeah. way. way yes. God bless. Let's meet same time. Happiness is a choice you have to make despite of everything happening around you. Wow. It's a space that you need to protect. Uh, and I think, you know, going through life can't take everything too seriously. Otherwise, the stress will, you know, kind of just blow the wind out of you. So, yeah, so uh, I try to have a good time, have to have a good laugh. Uh, my friends and I normally like to meet often. 
So Andrew David Ogutu will just be media space. Desert Island Discs.